Hey everybody, welcome back to your R3 groups. We're continuing our sermon series called Letters, where we're looking at the book of Ephesians. I had the privilege of preaching this Sunday on Ephesians chapter 4, and I called my sermon Soul Anchors. And you might remember that I started off by talking about the fact that the European Space Agency has recently landed a spacecraft on a comet some 317 million miles away from Earth, which is pretty amazing. However, the whole mission was almost lost when the anchors on the spacecraft didn't deploy. In fact, it just bounced right off of the comet and almost just went spinning off into space. But luckily, it did eventually come back down and landed um, on the comet. It's now sending us back data to Earth, and so everything is fine. But the whole thing was almost a wash. And I talked about the fact that we are people who lack soul anchors. When we come into relationships, sometimes we just kind of bounce off of them. Or when the terrain of life changes, it sends us careening off into outer space. When, when we don't get what we want, or when our dreams fail to become realized, our world can crumble or we can get depressed. You see, we are a people who lack a center. And when your soul lacks a center, you're a little bit like a car without a steering wheel. There's nothing to organize or to guide your life. Now the Apostle Paul, when he was writing the Ephesians, he knew that there was a persecution coming their way. Christians didn't have it very easy in the Roman Empire at this time, and he didn't want the church to split or to crumble. And so he talked about soul anchors to them, or at least he talked about what we're calling soul anchors. Here's what he said to them. He said, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. Now you might remember that we zoomed in to verse 2, where Paul gives four very simple but powerful words that have big implications for our lives today, and those words were this, humble, gentle, patient, and the last one we translated enduring. These are the four soul angers that we looked at, so let's dive in and, and uh, have a review of what those were. The first one was humble. Now you've heard this before at the Ransom, how humility was not considered to be a virtue in the ancient world. In fact, the word literally means lowly or servile, and, and it was considered to be morally offensive. In fact, the philosopher Aristotle, he attacked anything that, quote, makes the body or spirit of free men unable to nurture or develop virtue. He said that they hamper the spirit and make it humble. In other words, humility was the opposite of virtuous. So this gives you a little bit of perspective when you hear about a man named Jesus who came along in the Roman Empire and stood up one day and he said this. He said, whoever humbles himself like this child will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then we read later on in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, where Paul writes that Jesus humbled himself. You see, what we're realizing here is that no matter what you think about this man named Jesus, he has shaken the very foundations of our civilization, our language, our customs, our behaviors, even what we consider to be virtuous, have all been deeply influenced by Jesus Christ. Now you might remember that under each soul anchor I had what I called a soul check. This is something that you can ask yourself to see kind of how you're doing with this particular thing. And a soul check for humility was simply this. What am I like on the inside when I'm around someone who annoys me? If you're honest, this is a great way to measure your humility level. Soul anchor number two was gentleness. Now I think that we misunderstand gentleness. You see, gentleness doesn't mean that you're a convictionless pushover, because that certainly wasn't who Jesus is. It means that you handle your convictions in such a way that you use them for the well-being of others at as many levels of their being as you can. For example, you could try to bludgeon somebody with your convictions about politics or religion, and maybe by some small stretch of the imagination, they actually come to agree with you. But even if that's the case, you may have helped them intellectually, they may now understand something that they didn't understand before, However, you've humiliated them emotionally. Gentleness seeks to do as much well-being to the person as possible at all levels, even if it means absorbing some of the pain ourselves, and this takes courage. So the soul check for gentleness is this. What am I like inside when I know that I'm right? How do I handle being right? The third soul anchor is patience. In the book of Numbers, we read that when God's people grew impatient 
with the long journey that God had sent them on, the original text literally says that their souls grew short. And similarly, Samson was a man who had a short soul. He was kind of inflamed with passions, which caused him to do all sorts of erratic things um, and eventually got the best of him. He didn't have a long soul. So the soul check is simply this. How long is my fuse when I'm around those that I'm closest to? Often, we're the most impatient with our family members, and sadly, we're, uh, these are often the people that we're trying to impress the least. So this demonstrates how patient we really are. And the fourth and final soul anchor is endurance. You know, one of the difficulties that we have is that we want things immediately. We want it now, even to the point of settling for what's less. We prefer a little bit of pleasure today at the expense of eternal glory tomorrow. The Apostle Paul knew that for the church in Ephesus to stay together in the coming persecution, they would need to endure with one another. Some translations put it this way. They say, bear with one another in love. So the soul check for this one is simply this. Is there someone in this room that I tend to avoid? This is especially pertinent in small group settings because right now you're in a room with only a few people in it. But maybe there's not somebody in your small group that you tend to avoid, but what about at work? What about at church? What about at school? How are you doing at enduring with others? So that's our rewind for the week. I hope you have a great discussion with your group. Have you ever been on a lake or, or maybe even on the ocean? Have you ever been on a sailboat? Uh, I was blessed with the opportunity to uh, go to Seattle this past year and through a family friend connection, we got to spend uh, a day on the sea. We got to sail across the Puget Sound and it was an incredible experience. We got to go with a guy who was just completely fired up about sailing. He even lived part of the time on his boat and he took us across the sound. We went to an island to have lunch. It was just an incredible experience to be out there on the open ocean and, uh, and just walking along. Um, as we talked, I just got to hear a little bit more about why he loved sailing and he taught us about how he orients himself and how to steer the boat to pick a fixed reference point on the shore to direct ourselves at because the sea is always changing, always moving. Over the course of our discussion, we got to talking about an upcoming trip he had planned to go to fly to Florida, and then he was going to rent a sailboat and sail around the Bahamas for a week. And we got to talking about his plans and how he was going to execute all of this, and uh, and it was just exciting to hear his enthusiasm through the course of this conversation, we started talking about anchors, which was random at the time. Uh, but he started talking about the different kinds of anchors and their different uses and which ones he planned to use for his trip to make sure that he was secure as he slept at night uh, on this boat for his trip around the Caribbean. Pastor Phil Wiseman talked this week about soul anchors, those heart habits that we have, those abilities that we have to create within ourselves, fixed points of reference by which we can navigate our life. And as I got to thinking about the place of an anchor in a sea vessel and the place of an anchor in our spiritual walk, God just gave me some really practical points that I think we could walk through together. And the first is this, anchors ground us. A soul anchor is a deeply held belief that allows our inward world to be anchored while our outer world may be swirling. And anchors make sure that we are where we're supposed to be. They help us understand our reality better. We process life through our anchors. That is, first we process an anchor. We understand what God is teaching us, what he's doing, what he's trying to communicate to us. And then we must process the rest of our experiences through these anchors. Soul anchors are experiences or events or lessons that God teaches us through his word where we understand him better. They're fixed points of reference that we can hold fast to. And as I said before, we must process them as what they are. We must understand those events where God teaches us, where he meets us. But secondarily, once we have those anchors in place, they ground us. They make reality fit around us to what we experience in those moments. And so after we have a soul anchor in place, we process through them. Uh, we take them as truth and then we reconcile our world based on what God has already taught us. 
A great example of this is found in scriptures. It's in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 19. And the author of Hebrews says it this way. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. The author of Hebrews is pointing at the truth and revelation of Jesus and God's promises through there. And he says, these are strong and trustworthy that we can hope and these are worth grounding ourselves and worth anchoring ourselves to. And by them, we enter into the inner sanctuary. That is, we grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. So what is your soul anchored to? The second point is this, anchors hold us. When the world pulls us to and fro and tries to get us to go with the flow, to, to follow the current or to follow the crowds, anchors hold us in place. They keep us tethered to a fixed point. Now in the ocean, water is constantly moving. It's pushing and pulling and tides are coming in and out and you can't park a boat like you park a car. An anchor holds a boat in place so that the current and movement around it won't take it somewhere it isn't supposed to go. The world is like an ocean around us. There's constant movement. The people in our lives tend to make us drift, to pull us this way or that way, to make us go to and fro. And an anchor holds us in place. It allows us to process life and events and what's really important through those spiritually significant events as God equips us and enables us to walk through. So what holds your soul in place? What keeps you grounded as the ocean or as the world around you pulls you to and fro? What key ideas, memories, events, experiences help your soul know where it is when life goes this way or that? A third thought on anchors is this, that anchors orient us. Sometimes our journey in life takes us away from the shore. We lose our point of reference and we risk getting lost. Ancient sailors used to use stars to navigate the ocean, but sometimes life gets cloudy and we just get lost. A firmly placed anchor is a fixed point, a reference point. It's a pin drop on the map that says you are here. When we let God anchor us, we can process through the dark seasons in our life with what God has already taught us. We can find ourselves by remembering what we are anchored to. Four, anchors keep us steady. Now, confession time. When I started this R3, I didn't know anything about anchors. I assumed it was just something big and heavy that you threw off the side of the boat and that dug into the ground and just always held you in place. But I started doing some research quick and I actually learned a lot. See, there are times in the ocean in your seafaring journey when you don't want to drop an anchor. Sometimes when there's storms in life, an anchor actually will ground you to the bottom and not let you go with the swells of the waves. It will actually capsize your boat instead of keeping you afloat and safe. So there's actually a special kind of anchor that's used in this situation. It's called a sea anchor. It's designed to increase drag on your boat. That is to make sure it doesn't go as fast through the water. And it's to help keep us on course when the swells of life are big enough to capsize our boats. And I thought, wow, what a great life picture there. That there are times when our anchors simply serve to guide us or to make our journey a steady course. And when life goes up and down and when it's enough to capsize our boat, sometimes we need an anchor that just guides and directs and orients us in the midst of those seasons of life. So anchors keep us steady. They keep us on course. They help us be able to plan to reach the goals and the journey that God has us on as we follow him. This week, Pastor Phil Wiseman shared with us this idea that the key to having a meaningful life is to have an anchored soul. He said he gave us four key anchors from this one scripture verse, and he in invited us to identify those areas in our life. But there are more than just those four. So the question for us tonight is, what is your soul anchored to? What holds you? What helps orient you? What are those key life experiences that direct and guide your journey in the ocean and in the sea that you're sailing on? How do you find God in the dark times? Those soul anchors are critical opportunities for you to understand how God has developed and led you up until this point and to carry you on through as you follow him. I hope you have a great discussion tonight and I'll see you next week.